Welcome to the First Team College Football Recruiting Show with former NFL QB Matt Sims, Irish Breakdown Recruiting Analyst Ryan Roberts, and former college long snapper Joe DeLeon. Welcome back to another episode of the First Team College Football Recruiting Show. I'm Joe DeLeon, joined by former NFL and college QB Matt Sims, as well as the founder of Sims Complete QB. Joining us as well is Ryan Roberts, Irish Breakdown Recruiting Analyst. We've got a lot to get to. The national championship was this past weekend. We've got some trouble for the Florida Gators. Also, USC is making me look bad by picking up a huge transfer portal player. And then we're going to have some fun at the end of the show, revealing who our future top five teams are way too early right after the season ended for 2023. Guys, let's start things off here. Look, we just had... (laughs) a brutalization of TCU on live TV at a certain point. I thought they were going to cut the cameras out with how bad that game was 65 to seven as Georgia dominated on their way to a second national championship. And right when we hopped in here uh, to get ready to tape, Matt was fired up. Matt was really fired up to talk about this game and justifiably. So there were a lot of issues and a lot of reasons to be pissed off with the product that was presented to us on the field. Guys, I just want to talk takeaways for this game, and we're going to get to some other things that are related to this game as well from the recruiting perspective. But Matt, you were saying a lot of issues, uh, the the approach by Gillespie and and how they defensively prepared for this game and the lack of adjustments that they made. (laughs) Matt, what were your thoughts from this game? I think there's so many things that we could talk about here. Ryan just feels like I'm about to just blow up right now. But hey, I mean, (laughs) I don't want to go and be too crazy here, but nonetheless, this is my main point, right? We're talking about a multi-billion dollar company in college football, right? We're talking about a playoff committee of, you know, grown adults who are deciding the fates of young men and their futures and the opportunities for certain high uh, schools to obviously make a lot of money at this great opportunity to be in the college football playoff. Uh, We're talking about coaches, right, that are in just the spotlight of being in the biggest game in college football history. I think all three people in all three phases just completely failed the system. So first, let's start with this college football playoff committee. Everyone was always complaining about, hey, Alabama doesn't deserve to be in there. Their resume stinks, blah, blah, blah. Listen, I know one thing. Nick Saban and his resume as a coach would have gave us a better product if he was the fourth team ranked in there. I don't care if he would have lost five games this season. He would have at least had a game plan that was somewhat efficient enough to slow down Georgia to some degree. So I was very disappointed in that. I thought the fact that the ranking system was absolutely crazy. Really how it should have been played out. It should have been Georgia versus TCU in the first round. We would have gotten that blowout out of the way and done. The next matchup should have been Ohio State versus Michigan. Do the rematch right then and there. Get it over with and have the best team out of that situation because Ohio State probably would have won the second time around and we would have had a national championship that was actually worthwhile watching where it would have been Georgia versus Ohio State in the championship with the two, at the moment, best playing quarterbacks in college football the most athletic offenses and really the most well-coached, you know, or defense, I should say for really just Georgia because Ohio state's defense is suspect, but nonetheless, I just feel like the whole system failed. I think the defensive coordinator for TCU, I understand, Hey, you do what you do to get there. I'm not even going to mention his name. Hey man, hope all is well. Good luck with everything. But next time you play a team like Georgia in a game like that, don't just do what you do. Actually try to make Georgia think a little bit. Stetson Bennett didn't even sweat in the game. Didn't even sweat. He actually probably worked harder in the spring game than he did in the national championship. How is that even possible? I just don't Mm. understand. I'm just extremely disappointed in the entire system and how all these people say, you know, oh, their resume, this resume, that resume, you know, I don't know. I mean, we all know that it just took, you know, multiple shamrocks and horseshoes for TCU to get in that situation. And I just feel like as a society, we let them down, their players down by putting them in that position because they really did not deserve to be on the field with Georgia in the last game of the season. The coaches didn't deserve to be on the field with Georgia in that last game of the season. I just think that I'm just so disappointed with the situation, really for the players, because it's not their fault, 
right? They beat a Michigan team that, honestly, to me, I thought was a little overrated. We discussed it last time on the show, too. Their defense, right? Everyone talks about how great their defense. Ryan made the greatest point of all time. There's like nine teams in the Big Ten that weren't even the top 100 in offensive production. So I don't know how we can validate the resumes when we're not even really looking at the resumes. So sorry to go off on a tangent there. I'm just a little disappointed in the whole system. I'm disappointed that I had to wait an entire month for that finished product. And I'm really disappointed in the fact, too, that it's a billion-dollar corporation and you know all these people are making money on it, but yet that was the culmination of the college football playoff series. And I'm just upset with the grown-ups that are in charge mm. of this situation. I, didn't they? I mean, they moved from the BCS system to the committee approach because there's supposed to be some type of eye test that's involved with it, right? Like they don't want it to spit out a number, right? Like they don't want the the computer to to have that you know final say in what the product is on the field. And I feel like there is just too of an inconsistent look at the committee approach because I hear two sides to it, Joe. And I know we've talked about this before. You hear the resume, which, okay, we'll talk about the resume. And then we hear about the eye test. And I feel like those things have never come together, right? It's either right. you're a resume guy, you're an eye test guy. I think when you're talking about human nature, you're talking about humans putting the list together, you have to be more eye test than just the resume right at that point. Because I think that you understand that the Big 12 is not as strong as the SEC. That's a fact. I mean, we don't have to talk about that too much, right? It's not. Right. And I think that everyone deserves a chance, and I get that in TCU. But, I mean, at the end of the day, TCU wasn't even a Big 12 champion. They weren't even the conference's champion right. at, at that point. Right? And we and, saw what Alabama but, did to Kansas State. I mean, yes. come but, on, okay, man. But here, here's, the, here's the one issue, though, that – and I agree with where you guys are coming from. But the problem is who else do we put in that situation? And I think that this was the perfect year to prove that it needs to be expanded. This was the perfect year with so many unexpected variables that, and so much causation that put us in the situation where there was no right ordering to it. I think, Matt, well, what you said was a correct ordering. Sorry, the ordering was incorrect. I agree with you, Matt. But the teams that were placed were very clearly incorrect. But at the same point, I think you could have shuffled in a number of different teams. You, you could have put maybe Tennessee in there. You could have put Alabama. Who was that other team that should have been in there over TCU? Can, can I say this, though, Joe? I actually disagree with something you said there a little bit. Okay. You said that this is the year that proves it needs to be expanded. I think the opposite. Yeah. I think that this is the year that proves that it doesn't need to be expanded because there was nobody even close to Georgia this year. They well, were no. Well, so the, well, should this we go back the ex- to the archaic days of just handing it out to the, the best team? Yes, yeah, this is the thing, though. The, ex- the expansion, though, at least would have helped us filter out a TCU type of miracle season, I think, through yes. the semifinals. You know, like they they wouldn't have gotten they wouldn't have won three or four games in a row with an expanded playoff series, right? Just like when we're talking about the NFL, it's like everyone's like, oh, you know, hey, uh, twelve win Minnesota Vikings team, right? Does anybody really think they can win four games in a row and be a Super Bowl champion? No. Highly Joe unlikely. Joe probably does. I think Joe you know, probably does. But it's just like highly <laughs> unlikely <up>. that <laughs> some of those teams are going to put together three wins in a row, right, against high caliber opponents on the road potentially in some situations, right? So that's where it's like the expansion can at least somewhat naturally filter out predator versus prey in these different levels. So, Ryan, I know what you mean, and I, I, I'm not like trying to come at you, and I was mostly joking saying that because – to an extent, that is the way to resolve the situation is that we knew that Georgia was significantly better than every other team in the country. And their only real test that they faced was Ohio State because it was a perfectly uh, well set up matchup with each team's deficiencies. And we got a really good mm-hmm. competitive game and had totally. Ohio State freaking beat Michigan. We would have had the national championship that we wanted, but that right. didn't happen. And that's what caused all of these missteps in the ordering where these teams are placed. So uh, as joking as it is, that actual philosophy would have worked perfect this year because it would have just been, okay, Georgia plays their bowl game, which would have been uh, the Cotton Bowl or the Peach Bowl or or whatever bowl game they were thrown into. They blow out Mm -hmm. whoever they would have played, and then they would have been crowned the national champion by the AP or, or whoever, whomever would crown them. But I think I agree with Matt here is that a team that is has won all these close games, and if 
it was brought up with the Minnesota Vikings that if you flip their schedule, all those three point point differentials, they'd have a losing record. So for TCU's sake, the luck runs out at a certain point. And instead of it running out in the national championship, there's a couple roadblocks for them to get through. They also wouldn't have been an auto bid. They also might not have even have gotten in. That's the other thing too. Well, that's the thing. The luck would ran out. They lost in the or Big Kansas 12 State. championship game. It's over. Like they should yeah. not have advanced into the final four of the teams. And, and listen, this is no, I'm not even, I, I listen, there's a lot of good football players on TCU. So I don't want to rip them at all. But my also, yeah. I'm just very disappointed in the head coach and defensive coordinator too. I mean, you're telling me that when you were watching film preparing for Georgia, that you were going to have three minute the line of scrimmage with five other defenders, six or seven yards off the football. Like, what do you think is going to happen? Georgia is a a battle tested team that's in the SEC and their their offensive tackle and tight ends are blocking linebackers and making contact six yards down the field before they're met by the first TCU defender. I mean, that is just ridiculous to think that that's going to work. I told you guys before in the pre-show, there was about 50 plays before the snap where I was like, well, if Georgia does this, 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 or this, TCU can't defend it because there's not even a defender there to be there. You know, the, the Sonny Dykes interview at halftime, settle in. Dude, settle in because it's over. It's like Pulp Fiction at the very end right there. It's over, bro. I mean, like, come on, man. Like, just you have to steal possessions. You have to out coach and coach beyond talent and make sure that you're getting your guys an opportunity to win. And they didn't do any of that. They just ran mm. their standard stuff. And guess what? TC uh, Georgia didn't sweat for a second. Not for mm-hmm. one second. I didn't see one TCU receiver open by half a yard the entire game. Besides maybe the, the one big play that was down the field. That was a 50-50, you know, like that was just yeah. luck basically in that situation. But other than that, it's like, look at Stenson Bennett. He had probably 15 completions where I don't even think I saw a TCU defender within the screen within 10 yards. Like, that's a problem. And I don't think that's a, a, a Johnny's and Joe's issue. I think that's the coach's X's and O's issue. I think they just got mm-hmm. out coached. I think they got out schemed. I think they got overwhelmed by a group of men that knew exactly what to expect in that situation versus guys that were in over their head. And I, you know, I hate to be this blunt about it, but I just get really disappointed in the fact because this is amateur football. Nonetheless, it's somewhat professional now because people are getting paid. But it's still Mm -hmm. amateur football, and I just feel like the TCU coaching staff let their team down, which ultimately let down their entire program. I, I I would end my thoughts on two facts from this football game. One, I mean, you got outscored by 58 points in a national championship game, right? It's One team played their A game. The other team played probably their D game, right? But when those things are that far apart you can't have a 58 point difference. Like that's ridiculous. Right. I mean, cause if there's, if Alabama would have came in and I'm just gonna use Alabama as an example against Georgia, if Alabama came in and played their D game against a Georgia's a game, they probably lose 38 to 20, right? 38 to 20 something. Like they're still going to be relatively in the same ballpark. You can't have that much of a chasm between the two teams. Right. But my two, my two main takeaways are one, it's a short term. It was a bad product on that day, right? 65 to 7. Was, I, I went to bed at 45 7. And you guys know that I watch as much football as just about anybody. I was like, I stayed and watched just because. Yeah. I was like, I was like 45 yeah. 7, man. I got to be up at 5 30. I'm good. I don't need to do this anymore. Right. So I went to sleep. The long term, though, Joe, I think is it's going to be interesting because Georgia, and, and I know that we saw Nick Saban kind of like, like have this little look or whatever when David Pollock said it on the broadcast. Which was but awesome. Jor- <laughs> but Georgia has supplanted Alabama. They have supplanted themselves as the premier program in college football right now. So they now have their target on their back. That's who everyone was gunning for. I think for a long time, it was Alabama. That was the team you were gunning for. Now it's Georgia. That's the guy that they have to take down. Yeah, for sure. So I want to pivot and wrap up this Georgia discussion with this. You set up a really good point here, Ryan. Can they three-peat? That is what everyone has been talking about because we immediately, in the third quarter, we turned the page and started talking about, can this team do it again next year? Can this team do it again next year? We didn't even wait for the, the, the body to be cold for us to start talking about this. 
And I think it's a really interesting discussion. And there's so many variables that come into play here because you look at Georgia's schedule next year. It is terrible. It is really soft. It's very easy for them to go undefeated yet again because of how easy their schedule is. But at the same time, I am unwilling to commit to them saying to, to saying that they can win a national championship again next year. I think having a veteran experienced quarterback is very important. Uh, losing Stetson Bennett with, for all the damn games that he played in and being 25 years old was huge for them this year. He was so composed in every single game that they needed him to step up. And I know that I have my qualms with him as a, as a quarterback and as an all time great, but separate from that, he is a big reason why they had offensive success. At the same time, they're also losing guys like Jalen Carter, Keely Ringo, Nolan Smith. There's a lot of guys, other guys that might even declare as well on that defense. Now I know that they reload really, really well. Yeah. It's like concerns still Damon over. Wilson, Mapemba, Jordan Hall, Gabriel Harris, all Jamal Jarrett. Like, I mean, all these dudes, Pierce Sperling, Lawson Luck. I mean, like we're talking about guys that are like, you know, it, it's not your run in the mill recruiting crash like we discussed in the past, you know? So that's where, right. you know, they're, they're reloading with a lot of really efficient talent that can play day one. Exactly. So here's where my concern is, though, Matt, is do we trust the quarterback situation, which is either Carson Beck, who was a four star recruit, or Brock Vandergriff, who was a five star recruit? Or I Gunner, Gunner and Stockton. Don't, don't forget about Gunner. Or Stockton. Gunner. Yeah. Or, or, Gunner. or Gunner Stockton. Yeah. So there's three guys and not an answer there. And the thing right. that scares me for, especially at the quarterback position, as highly rated as all these guys were, there's a chance that. All three of these guys stink. There's a chance that one of these guys, kind of like the North Carolina situation, or one of them's prolific. So there's just too much uncertainty for me to commit and say that they will go back for a third national championship. Ryan, I want to kick it to you first on this one because it looks yeah. like you got a thought. Yeah, no, I, so I, my immediate thought is this, and it's something that Matt stated, which I think is an underlying thing because I, I think that we do focus too much on the Jimmys and the Joes sometimes. The coaching staff that Kirby Smart has put together is fantastic. I think that we can't talk enough about what Todd Munkin did with totally. this team offensively. Great. Great point. I mean, in that game, yes, TCU did not adjust. They were not prepared defensively. But also, Todd Munkin called a game, man. He called a mm. game. And I mean, was- all the formations and different looks that he gave TCU, yeah. like it was just so overwhelming. It looked like an NFL team out there the way they looked. Sorry yeah. to cut you off, Ryan. No, no, no. It's a perfect point. And I think that when one thing that we underrated on this team is you're right, Joe. I mean, having a veteran quarterback is very important. There's no doubt. But Stetson Bennett was a former two star recruit that had didn't play till pretty much his fourth year in the program. Right. I mean, that traveled too. like he was on a, a junior college team at one point. Right. But you're talking about a two star and with all the talent they have. Who was their leading receiver, wide receiver in that football game? It was Lad McConkey, who's also a former <laughs> two-star player, right? Totally. So I think that for me, I look at what Monken has done as their offensive coordinator, and he has put these guys in incredible positions. And, of course, they have talent, right? I mean, you have the two running backs. You have the tight ends. The offensive line has some former five-star caliber players. You need those types of dudes. But do I think that he can get the most out of Gunnar Stockton next year or – Carson Beck or Brock Vandegrift? Yeah, I do because I think that he is he has a full ability, and it's all due respect to Stetson Bennett, right? Because he ended up getting the most out of his talent. But the fact of the matter is, is all three of those players that we named are much more talented yeah. than Stetson Bennett from a talent perspective, mm-hmm. right? Well, so JT Daniels though was a five star, and he got bumped out by Stetson, so it's like the he, star thing. But he was, was he was injury still productive. Though. But through he was still injury, productive. yeah, he was that's, still productive that's true. with Todd Munkin. That's through true. injury, gave Stetson the door for him to step in through and then take over. And I know that you named a couple of the premier guys that they're losing this year, right? You talked about Stetson. You talked about Jalen Carter, who's going to be a top five pick in the draft. But I would also say this, Joe, is that they're actually bringing back a lot, man. I think one thing that we underrated with the Georgia team as well, this is a pretty young football team for the most part. Right. I, I saw Michael Williams yeah. as maybe their best defensive lineman as a true oh, freshman, right? The, yeah. the Bear Alexander kid had two sacks. He was a true freshman defensive lineman. Malachi Starks may have been their best defensive back this year. He was a true freshman. Number 22, the safety that had the interception during the football game, was a sophomore. That their Brock Bowers will be back next year. They'll have at least three starting offensive linemen back. I think that this team, with how they're recruiting and with what they're bringing back, do they have a chance to 3 Pete? The answer is yes. Will it happen? I'm not going to predict it either. But do they have a chance? Absolutely. Talent is still there. 
Yeah, no doubt. And I, I want to say just to add to this, right? Stetson Bennett, you cannot take away anything he has done, right? He was the right guy at the right time for this program to, to take off to where it is, to these heights that they've never seen. One of the biggest things I think that everyone is just kind of underplaying, you're really replacing just his attitude at the position. His talent, no doubt. There's a ton of dudes that are ta more talented than Stetson Bennett. No doubt, right? Bigger, stronger, faster, stronger arms, all that kind of stuff. But it's what his, his attitude to the position, which matched Kirby Smart's attitude to how he coaches his football team, that really made that a perfect match made in heaven. You know, that he has a little, you know, uh, to him, right? That I don't want to have Joe bleep out here. So I'm going to say that instead. But just <laughs> thank you, Matt. <laughs> that's that's the biggest thing that they're really replacing. They're replacing someone that has that attitude, that commander in chief like approach to the game that just loves just kicking butt and just rubbing their nose in it, right? And that's really the biggest thing that they have to do because they'll find the guys that are more talented for sure. It's really going to be the attitude aspect of it. But Ryan, so many good points. All the guys that you mentioned were all the guys that I wrote down prepping for the show too that I was just like, listen, I mean, Barry Alexander, I don't know. It looks like he's a first-round draft pick a year or two from now. You know, I mean, it's just ridiculous how good of a player that he looked. And he is in the second unit of their defensive line. The wow. second unit. It's wild, right? And he was eating up that offensive line every single play, right? Because he had one on one blocks essentially every time that he went out there. You know, but so both, both the linebackers are back next year, too. I didn't even mention those. Yeah. Guys. Man, yeah. both the linebackers are back, too. So it's just like, you know, you got guys like the recruiting class that we mentioned, the guys that we just mentioned there, uh, you know, Dumas Johnson, Jalen Walker, Bear Alexander, Mikhail Williams, like you mentioned. I mean, these guys are dudes out there. And again, the biggest thing is Kirby Smart knows how to motivate his team. He knows how to push the right buttons. He's relentless, just like his man who taught him a lot of these things, Nick Saban. And yep. that's why I have faith in Georgia. And listen, there was a lot of plays too where it's like, I know Stetson Bennett, you know, played a fantastic football game. But, I mean, let's be real, though, too. I mean, Joe, you could have ran in for a touchdown on the goal line there on that one little quarterback sweep to the left there. There wasn't one TCU defender within nine yards. There was three <laughs> Georgia offensive linemen pulling around the edge, and they were like, no one's there. They were blocking camera guys in the end zone because there was nobody there because they were that <laughs> out of place. So, you know, it's, it's going to be – um, I think it's 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 a dynasty that is in the process of continuing going forward, and it's going to be very difficult to unseat them right now. And they won a national championship last year at thirteen and one, or fourteen and one, excuse me, or whatever, thirteen and one, right? Thirteen and, and one. they lost fifteen draft picks off that team, and they right. may have been a more well balanced team this year than they were last yeah, year. I right. Mean, we can't undersell that, man. Like they lost a lot from last year's team, and you could argue that they were a more well-rounded team this year, which is right. just crazy to think about. And let's face it, too, well, Brock Bowers is one of the best skill players in the entire nation. You know, yeah. he really is. He's NFL ready right now. He really yeah. is. He'd be one of the top five, top ten tight ends in the NFL right now if he was out there running routes. You know, it's just Absolutely. ridiculous how good of a football player he is. Georgia. Really freaking good, and it all starts with the recruiting and the guys that we talk about and we're going to be talking about on this show. But we've got a little recruiting drama that we have to get to, something that can't be ignored in the N uh, in the NIL era these days. Money, checks not cashing, apparently, seems to be an issue for Jaden Rashada, who one of the top quarterbacks in the 2023 class, was originally committed to Miami. He flips to Florida, and now he's asking out of his national letter of intent. By the way, I, I got to say, it's so annoying trying to transition from NIL to NLI. One of the it's so bad, biggest man. tongue twisters. It's so it, confusing. It, yeah. I, I, well, it's I not even confusing. I, I just mess it up sometimes, which is annoying. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It, it, for the rest of my career, it's going to mess me up now that those are the two things. Because I am I was previously just used, used to NLI, but separate from that. Rashada now asking to be removed from that letter of intent. Uh, he was the crown jewel of that Florida recruiting recruiting class. He was the big reason why they were bumped up maybe in the rankings. And separate from that, like they got some decent players, but them getting Rashada was a huge, huge steal. He's not going though. And I know that there's all the, the angles that we can sit here and take and talk about like why wasn't his money 
why didn't his money get to him? There's also the the speculation if that is the real reason why he is making this decision to not go to Florida. Florida still has to release him at the time of this taping of this show. But my focus here now is are we concerned with the direction of Florida football? Are we worried about what is transpiring for Billy Napier and the Florida Gators? Because frankly, guys, for me, this feels eerily similar to what happened with Brian Harson in the sense that you just start to hear rumors and rumors that he doesn't have control over his program. And those rumors come from somewhere. And it's more than likely coming from the boosters and the boosters that maybe didn't want to hire him trying to fight against the ones that did. And I am very worried that this might crash and crumble before anything can happen and any results can be produced because they lost a lot of freaking kids to the transfer portal and they didn't do a very good job of reloading. Matt, I just want to kick it to you first here. What do we think? Do we or Should we be worried about Billy Napier in Florida? Yeah, I mean, it's really hard for us to sit here and say that everything is, you know, sunshine and rainbows there right for Florida. So there absolutely is some concern. I think really the concern is, is between the head coach and then the booster program, like you mentioned. I think for whatever reason, there is not a there's a disconnect there that is leading to some of these situations as far as the NIL deals and the situation with the quarterback. Right. I mean, you know, I think JTM Sports, which is the agency that represents, um, you know, Rashada, basically, you know, in one shape or another reading between the tea leaves just said that it just doesn't make sense for someone of his high profile caliber to go to to uh, Florida to receive that, you know, that opportunity there. Right. So there's clearly something right that is not connecting. The dollars and cents don't make sense for these guys. I mean, essentially now, if you're a four or a five star quarterback recruit, you're getting paid seven figures for that position. And someone must have enticed him and that agency in the last minute to make him think otherwise. And I think he is being advised by them to ask for the NLI in return to be released. Excuse me, because I wanted to make sure I pronounced it correctly. So, you know, and that's where I think we're at. I don't think it has anything to do with like he feels comfortable with the coaches or, you know, the atmosphere, the school, the education, all that BS. It doesn't matter because we all know how special of a place Florida yeah. is. At the end of the day, it's dollars and cents. Rashada didn't like what he was hearing right yeah. from the dollars and cents. JTM agency uh, said, we agree and we would advise you to ask to be released. And that's where we're at in this situation. So I think it is a head coach booster issue that both sides need to come together on and agree upon to make sure that they are one conscious mind with recruiting these guys going forward and on the exact same page of making sure that they are nailing down these these recruits. Matt, you were on fire today, man, because I agree with everything you just said for the Thank most you, part, Ryan. Man. That it means was, a lot to me because I really it, respect it, your opinion and what you know <laughs> about the game. So that means a lot for real. No, nah, <laughs> man, that was really insightful because I, I agree with you, right? I mean, there's always going to be – there's always going to be excuses that are thrown out there why a right. fit doesn't make sense. But, like, let's call a spade a spade, right? Like, this is why. And Jaden Rashad has been up front for the most part about NIL being a big thing for him. And yeah. no judgment here. If that's big for you, that's big for you. That's fine. You have the opportunity right. to make that money if you choose to, right? But, I mean, let's not forget that his other school that he was committed to was Miami, right? Which Miami's not in a great situation right now either from a win-loss right. perspective. And there's a lot of question marks there. I mean, back to your question, though, Joe, for me – Am I worried about the future of Florida football? I mean, yes, but I would have been I would have been concerned even if Jaden Rashada would have signed with the University of Florida. Yeah, great point. Yeah, yeah. Because I, it, I just they lost a lot of players to the transfer portal. There was a lot of turnover. There is clearly players on this roster that are not buying into Billy Napier. And I actually liked Billy Napier when he first got hired. I thought it was an under the radar good good hire. I liked him as a coach when he was at Louisiana Lafayette, or I guess it's just University of Louisiana now. But there are some things behind the scenes right now that you're just like people aren't buying in. I mean, let's just call it what it is, right? I mean, right now going into the season, they're going to have Graham Mertz as their starting quarterback. That's where we are at the University of Florida. It is not right. great. It's not sunshine and rainbows to Matt's point. It's not. There's a lot going on at in Gainesville right now that is troubling, especially when you consider 
Florida State is starting to get back to that spotlight, right? Yeah. Miami is going to be in these back and forth with Florida, as we have already seen in the Jane Rashada conversation, because they are a big NIL team and they have a lot of money backing, like Florida does as well. So there's a jockeying kind of feel right now to who is that team in Florida, who can rise from the ashes, not to be too sentimental but, here but that's second, also but. just the state of florida too i mean think true. about the sec yeah. east Whole in general east. you got that's georgia true. sorry bro you got tennessee <laughs> sorry bro like those two teams right now really have a great understanding of what they're trying to do as far as a conglomerate company right i mean that's yeah. really what you got to look at when these when we're talking about this tennessee to me is a rising star you know, they really are. The only problem is, is that they got the best team in the country that's in a dynasty at the moment. <laughs> it's true. And, it's and very true. one thing I just want to add here, too, though, is, is if we remove the speculation that there is some uh, tension between him and, and maybe the boosters and there is that possibility he gets pushed out. Remove right. that for a second. Say that the everybody of Florida loves him. If I'm a recruit and there is uh, NIL involved and you're hearing the stuff that's going on with Rashada, I am not listening to a goddamn word that Billy Napier is telling me. I wouldn't trust anything. If, if this is related to either him not getting his money or what the stuff you were talking about, Matt, if you're being advised by your agency to pull out after you signed, after you're told you were given a certain amount, I'd be really freaking worried. And I'm telling you right now, this is going to hurt them so much with so many recruits. They're going to be out of the billing, out of the competition for so many recruits that are going to be like, why the hell would I listen to you? That's the biggest thing, right? Is just the fact that it's the ripple effect of these things. Yes. Right. It really is. And and that's where right now we can't quite see how heavy of a moment this is for Florida, but it is definitely extremely damaging. And we don't know how long, how down long down the line this ripple effect will have on their entire program. Because I mean, hey, Graham Mertz starts the season. Let's say that they start the season and they just go the first three or four games and they're 500. You know, he's he's in trouble. This is going to be a problem, and they're gonna they're gonna ax it faster. You know, than let it play out because the more time that it plays out, the farther behind they fall with just transitioning into that next generation. And Florida has such a high standard of football. Right. right. Like they right. are one of the premier programs. They're not going to deal – they're not going to put up with this mediocrity for long, right? No, like, I mean, no. what does Napier have? Maybe another year if it doesn't get turned around pretty swiftly. So the University of Florida long-term will be okay. But as for the Billy Napier era, I think it's very dependent on what happens next season. For sure. Absolutely. Guys, I want to transition here. A little transfer portal news. Anthony Lucas, a former – top recruit who was at Texas A&M and that's another uh, program in the SEC that's dealing with a little bit of drama with the amount of guys the amount of young players guys have transferred Joe 26 disgusting players disgusting amount and I'm willing to bet that that number goes up by the time that spring ball is done with and like I'm all sure 26 that played that's the craziest thing right <laughs> right right I mean these right. are guys that were on playing meaningful snaps for them the entire season former five stars uh, and, right yeah, yeah. Yeah. A, a quick tangent, by the way, for all of us that have played through spring ball, when your team sucks and you go through spring ball and your coach is on your ass, I am willing to bet there are at least three or four more kids that hop in the portal. There is nothing worse than getting uh, – I was almost cursed there – getting reamed <laughs> out by your by your coach when your team is bad and you don't have a lot of respect for them. So, again, I'm willing to bet more guys hop in the portal. But for the USC angle – USC lands Anthony Lucas. And I remember texting Ryan about this. He might, there was a possibility maybe he went to Notre Dame. There was a possibility that maybe he goes to other programs that were in the running for Anthony Lucas. And look, I sat here on this show. I sat here on other channels and said, I'm disappointed with USC's recruiting. I think it sucks. I said that they didn't do a good enough job bolstering their defensive line. They're proving me long, wrong a little bit here. They kept Alex Grinch, which I hate, but them adding Anthony Lucas is a massive ad for them on this defensive line. Ryan, I want to go to you because I know you know a good amount good amount about Anthony Lucas. What do you think? How much of an impact is this ad for them? Well, and that's why recruiting is so much different now is that transfer portal stuff is involved in recruiting now because you just got a kid that is a true sophomore. You're going to have him for at least two years, right, ideally. Yeah. 
And he's a former five-star recruit, so that does bolster this class, right? you got a five-star caliber defensive lineman to come to town. And for people that haven't seen Anthony Lucas, he's out of the Arizona area originally. And he went to Texas A&M, obviously, played a little bit as a freshman. But this kid was a high four, five-star caliber player, depending on which recruiting platform that you value, right? Like he's that type of player. A kid that at 6'5", 300 pounds, can play big end, can play inside in three tech, could play some nose in spurts. Very versatile player, right? And he's an incredibly talented kid. I know that things obviously didn't work out at Texas A&M, both on the field and off the field this year for Anthony with what his expectations were. And I knew that he was going to go pretty far away. You know, there was some talk about Mm. Notre Dame being interested. There was some talk about him just wanting to get away from Texas. Family just kind of wanted him to get away from the situation and go have a fresh start somewhere. So USC gets a kid for their team. And we talked a lot about the Alex Grinch system, right? But they're going to play a lot of three-down stuff. And Anthony Lucas is a perfect fit for that. For a team that's losing totally, uh, I'm not going to pronounce his last name, who was their best defensive player by far, and losing Figueroa, who was number 50 for their defense, it was kind of also that big end, three-tack yeah. type player. He mm-hmm. is going to slot right into that defense and be a difference maker, I think, from day one. So it's a big grab for USC. I think it's a really nice scheme fit for Anthony Lucas, even though I'm not the biggest Alex Grinch fan with uh, with some of the inconsistency he has from being kind of gap sound and disciplined. Anthony Lucas in that attack style defense is going to be a really key cog and a really good football player. So there's no doubt – Anthony Lucas is a massive get for USC program. Yeah, definitely agree with everything that you said, Ryan. I think the biggest thing to kind of take away that, you know, for all of us, right, when we talk about college football, this is a young man who was away from home. And it sounds like one of the most important things was is being a little bit closer to home. The advantage was, right, or at least that's how he puts it right in the media, right, with comments that I read in articles, right, is that he wants to be closer to home. That Arizona USC is a little bit closer to the people that love and care about him. I think also the fact is is that he's you know going to a situation where as a rush end in the Pac-12, he has no competition as far as depth at his position. So he starts right away. The other aspect is is that every quarterback in that conference throws it about thirty to forty times a game, so he can rack up individual statistics despite what USC's overall total defense is, you know, compared to the conference and the rest of the nation. So he can Mm -hmm. accomplish more or less what he needs to accomplish as an individual to move on to hopefully that next level of becoming an NFL pass rusher, which is the ultimate goal for about 98% of these college football players, right? So in that situation, I just think that USC, hey, man, it's a sexy school to go to. It's a smaller school. It really is. So everyone always, you got to keep in mind, it's a private school. There's only like 10,000 people within the entire school. So it's a smaller community. I think just the allure of playing with Lincoln Ryan and Kayla Williams and all that is just a little bit more attracted to him, considering the fact of the situation with Jimbo Fisher and Texas A&M in the past year and a half and how all that has played out. So I think there's a lot of benefits for him as the individual to go in there, succeed more uh, at a quicker rate than what he did at Texas A&M. Mm. Guys, I want to wrap with this here. We've got five minutes to go in the show. We're going to rip through our way too early top uh, top fives, and then we'll just give like over a quick time. thought. We're not, <laughs> but we quite literally can't go over time, Matt, because the TV <laughs> scheduling prevents that. Damn Breaking it. the fourth wall. That's what we call a fourth wall break, by the way. Uh, yeah. Guys, let's rip through, though. Share our top fives for next season, and then maybe just a quick thought. I'm going to start here with my top fives, the way that I see it, Georgia, I'm a little bit worried about that quarterback situation, as I talked about earlier, but still we know how talented that roster is. It's the best coaching staff in the country without a doubt, putting them at number one and not putting them there would be a total crime. So putting them at number one and seeing what happens, what pans out that Georgia team is going to be really uh, competitive next year. Number two, I really like what Michigan is bringing back, Blake Corum returning, having a veteran quarterback in J.J. McCarthy, who is a former five-star kid. That is massive for them. And assuming that he takes that next step mentally, maturity-wise, uh, stepping into uh, high-pressure games and, and not decreasing his performance level, having him back is going to be great for Michigan assuming Jim Harbaugh doesn't leave. Number three, Florida State. I, I think that Jordan Travis 
has been playing at a Heisman level for the past few games, and he is going to be in that Heisman conversation heading into the season until he has a bad performance. They bring back so much. They killed it in the portal. They killed it in recruiting. And then Jared Verse coming back on the defensive side of the football makes them extremely dangerous playing in a pretty weak conference in the ACC. Number four, LSU. I love that Jane Daniels returns. I've said a million times that I think that Jane Daniels is the perfect quarterback for what Brian Kelly loves and looks for in a quarterback. And we saw him slowly get better as the season progressed. And it's pretty promising the way that they finished the season with that massive win over Purdue. And last, guys, number five, Oregon. Another team that cleaned up in the portal, adding a Johnny Cornelius playing alongside on that offensive line, a bunch of highly rated kids. Uh, Bo Nix comes back, which is unexpected. Again, I always lean these veteran quarterbacks. I think it's so important. And we saw that he looked a lot more composed. He looked a lot more comfortable. And I think that that is a really big uh, move for Oregon and the Ducks to get him back. So, Ryan, I want to kick it to you second here. Who are your top five teams for next season? Yeah, I mean, we have a lot of similar at the top. I mean, Georgia for me, and if you listen to the beginning of this episode, they're a team that is was quietly a pretty young football team. I know they have to replace a Stetson Bennett. They have to replace a Jalen Carter. But at, with the way they recruit, the talent is going to be there. The coaching is there. I think that they have a chance to three-peat. I really do. I have number two is Alabama, and I know that it's boring and it's, it's predictable. But I think you saw on the recruiting trails for 2023 – that Nick Saban's got a little bit of a chip on his shoulder. And I think having a couple losses this year, you're going to see them really come back and play really inspired football to prove that they are still the elite of college football. So despite losing Bryce Young, Will Anderson, we know how Alabama recruits and what they just did in 2023. So I think Alabama's going to have a nice bounce back year after a couple losses this year. And the bowl game, I think, was kind of the initial starting point there. Pains me to put Michigan at number three, but I think that there are a lot of building blocks to come back on. You know, you mentioned Blake Corm, you mentioned J.J. McCarthy. They're always going to be well coached defensively. I think under uh, Jesse Minter, their defense coordinator, they're going to have another nice season next year. Number four, my sleeper team a little bit is University of Washington. I think that they have a lot coming back. Braylon Trice, Jeremiah Martin defensively, but more importantly, they have Michael Panix Jr. coming back at quarterback, Romeo Dunsey at wide receiver, Jalen McMillan coming back, offensive line led, led by Roger Rosengarten at right tackle, I think is really going to be a very good team next year. And then I stuck number five, Notre Dame, who is the number five team on the national title odds initial list. I think that Notre Dame obviously had their struggles a little bit this year, but still won nine football games first year under Marcus Freeman. Quarterback was a point of emphasis that was not good enough throughout the year you put Sam Hartman on this team this past year I think that they go at minimum 11 and 1 in the regular season and they're in contention for the college football playoffs with Sam Hartman and the young football team that they were this year with a lot coming back next year Joe Walt Blake Fisher wide receivers Audrick Estime at running back the defense that should be better in year two under under Al Golden I think Notre Dame is going to be a very good team next year so that's to round out my top five Joseph Damn, Matt that was good, out. Ryan. Really good. <laughs> hey, numero uno. All right, just like Arnold Schwarzenegger. All right, dominating. All right, hey, it's Georgia. He's the man. They're the man. All right, and you know what? And I'm doing this for the benefit of the rest of the country too. We should all put them at number one, just so hopefully they fall asleep a little bit at the wheel and get a little content. Even though Kirby Smart, they like to eat off the floor, probably won't happen. But we'll do this for the rest of the country just to give you an opportunity to hopefully they fall asleep, but it won't happen. Georgia, number one. It's clear and obvious. Uh, Number two, I'm putting Ohio State. Ryan Day, I think, continues just his fantastic career. I know he's lost to Michigan the past two years, but I do believe that they can correct some of these things. Rivalry games are always a little bit interesting, especially because it's one and two in the Big Ten that way with Michigan and Ohio State. But I do think that Ryan Day gets the better of Michigan this year with Kyle McCord at quarterback and with the most talented receiving core in that conference and potentially in the country with Marvin Harrison, uh, Mbuke, and then Fleming, who hopefully if he stays healthy, can really make a great impact for this football team as well. Number three is Alabama. Alabama's number three, very simply because it's Nick Saban, just like with Ryan said. I don't think that Nick Saban is going to allow this football team to have this lull. My one concern with Alabama and Michigan is coaching situations. With Alabama, if Coach O'Brien leaves 
How do you fill the void at the offensive coordinator position? Because I do think that Coach O'Brien potentially could be the next offensive coordinator with the New England Patriots considering their situation over there. So that's a huge concern for me. But nonetheless, I still believe in Nick Saban and what he does as a coach and all the football players that they got in the recruiting class. Uh, Number four, one of my toughest decisions here, I wasn't really sure exactly who to go with. Um, I am going to just include some of the Pac-12 here in this four and five position. Um, is USC. I'm going to put USC up there, right, just because it's Caleb Williams. It's the Caleb Williams show, and I expect them to throw uh, and, and make a lot of big plays and put up 50 points a game in the Pac-12 every week. You know, number five is Oregon. I do think that Bo Nix really did a good job of improving. I think the team as a whole is a really good football team and balanced, and I do think that they are going to be – you know, 1A, 1B with a Washington on their heels in the Pac-12 going this year. Now, I'm very heavy SEC Pac-12 with my top five. I threw in Ohio State because I really think it is their conference to be had. I'm very interested to see how Penn State adjusts because I love Penn State's defense. If Penn State could be a little bit more offensively explosive, I think they're going to have a fantastic year as well. Florida State's fascinating to me too. And can't forget always our boys, Tennessee, baby. Let's go, Joe Milton. All right, take over. <laughs> take over the show. Hypel, I believe in you, man. I think we're making you know the right stride. So I think they're in the heels too of that top five as well. Um, but yeah, that's my list right there. George, Ohio State, Alabama, USC, and Oregon. And um, I wanted to put Michigan, but I think Harbaugh's out, man. So I'm not going to put Michigan in there because of that. 